I'm Tarina Taron, the Senior Director for Research and Innovation. Um, so the Stellenbosch Forum Series is something that we um, coordinate um, together with our researchers. Uh, we started this series already in 1990, so it's been running for, for a long time. And it really is aimed at providing opportunities for Stellenbosch University staff and students, as well as members from the public, to learn more about the relevant and impactful research being done at Stellenbosch University. Um, so uh, we ask our presenters to present their work, um, their academic work to us in such a way that it's understandable um, to non-experts in the field. And this then provides an excellent opportunity for cross-disciplinary discussion and, to, and for critical debate around these issues. Um, so uh, we will have eight lectures this year in 2022. So for those of you attending today, um, we're really looking forward to you also attending our other lectures coming in the series. Um, and we decided as a, as a small committee to focus on a very specific theme this year, and the theme will be changing climates. So very aptly, we are starting with climate as in the real sense of the word today um, with Professor Guy Midgley. But we will also look throughout the series at changing climates and changing environments in terms mm -hmm. of, of natural resources, health, education, history, economies, and more topics. So the focus will really be on our research at Stellenbosch University and how it can be impactful in finding possible solutions to these changing um, environments. So um, we are really looking forward today to hear about um, some ideas around solving the global, global climate crisis. Uh, for those of you inside Stellenbosch University, Professor Guy Mitchley probably hardly needs any introduction. Um, you have seen his biography, so I'm not going to the biosketch, I'm not going to read through it all. Um, so you can read it at your leisure in the invitation. But suffice to say that Professor Mitchley is a distinguished professor in botany and zoology at Stellenbosch University and is currently the acting director of two very important and very large multidisciplinary um, entities at the university. The first one is our newly established School for Climate Studies, and he's also currently acting as the director for the Center of Invasion Biology, um, a very well known entity. So, Professor Mitchley, without any further ado, um, I'm going to hand over to you and we're looking forward to your presentation. I would like to ask all, all attendees just to switch off their cameras and their microphones, please. And I'm going to do the same right now. Thank you, Guy. Thanks, Trina. Thanks for the introduction. And thanks all of you who've turned up to listen. That's really great. I hope to be able to entertain you. Um, I, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to take you through just the latest science that has come out of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, just to, you know, just to firm up where we are and what we understand about this crisis. And then I want to talk about the solutions and in, in a fairly high, at a fairly, fairly high level, and uh, I want to, it's a little bit of a pilot uh, experiment in a way. I want to do some interactive work with, with people here and uh, run through a really interesting online tool that I've been using in, in my teaching for the last couple of years. And uh, to test the ideas that you might have uh, around what the, the biggest solutions to the crisis uh, on the side of, of, of keeping emissions down and keeping the temperature down. Of course, the crisis has other aspects to it that we, we, we can't forget about. But actually, to understand the, the position that we're in, I think this is a quite an interesting way to look at it. And it can be very illuminating. So, uh, and I really appreciate your feedback on, 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 on what, you, what you feel about this. So, uh, so, okay, so I'm quickly going to run through the, the latest findings from IPCC as you probably all know the Intergovernmental Panel has just finished uh, one of its major assessment cycles. It's six assessment cycle um, and the three working groups which cover the science of climate change, the science of impacts adaptation and that of mitigation um, all have produced reports and the next step is, is the production of a synthesis report where everything is put together. But we're already at a point now where we can look at all the latest science across these 
elements and um, remind ourselves of how strong the science is and uh, maybe where some of the uncertainties are. All right, so that's what I'm going to do. I'm, I, would, I hope to be able to finish um, you know, the, the talk in, in about 15 minutes or so, maybe 20, and then we'll go into this inter, in the interactive experimental side of things, which, which might be quite fun. All right, so that's what we're going to do. Um, Tarina, would you be able to track questions in the chat possibly or yes uh, happily happily do great that. And, yeah. and then maybe you can work with me in the interactive section just to just shout if, if people have made i'm going to ask people for suggestions on how to solve the crisis so we're going to solve it together <laughs> right, in theory good so let's 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 get going let me uh, let me move on <clears throat> all right so where are we well, uh, what we now know very well is that the effects, the accumulated effects of, of socioeconomic development <clears throat> threaten what is called dangerous interference with the climate system. This phrase, dangerous interference with the climate system, is formally captured in the, um, the, in the framework convention on climate change. So this is, it's, it's sometimes called, uh, um, uh, it, it's a, it's a well-recognized phrase in the negotiations around, around this, this issue. And it is defined in Article 2 of the Framework Convention. You can go and Google that and, and look at what Article 2 is, and it defines what dangerous interference is. The second point I want to make is that the solutions that we need to find as a, as a society, as a global society, must balance the need for development, some kind of socio-economic development or transition, together with the sustainable use of our environmental resources, while also responding to climate change. This is a triple challenge of epic proportions. And uh, you know, the good news is that we, we have the science to understand a lot of it. And um, but the question now is how do we get towards solutions? Do we have the political will? Do we have the economic will and the um, ability and the understanding of how our economic system works to be able to, to reach uh, some kind of a sustainable future where more people, everybody can benefit? So the final point is that the, the transitions and the changes that, that are needed has, has been re uh, revealed now by the latest IPCC reports are really amongst the most challenging ever faced by modern society. So this is this is no small task that we're, we're facing. One card that we have in our pack, one ace up our sleeve, has been, I think, the incredible work of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which is generated you know, from uh, the, the United Nations, where all members uh, um, propose scientific experts to sit on the intergovernmental panel and uh, to develop these uh, these assessments, the best assessments of the science of climate change. These have been going on since since 1990, and in in, in several iterations of between four to six years. And through that time, the science has strengthened tremendously. And that is what underpins the negotiations at the Framework Convention on Climate Change. I will say that uh, civil society is often um, uh, somewhat uh, crit critical of the, the, the slow pace of these negotiations. But if you look at what the IPCC had to say in, in 1991, that the first report said that it would take at least a decade for the human impact on climate to be uh, detected without doubt. So, so 91, they said that it's going to take at least until the early 2000s before we can attribute the, uh, the effect of climate to, to humans. And indeed, it was only in the 2007 report, the fourth assessment report, where uh, IPCC could say the human impact is uh, exists without any doubt. That was only 14 years ago, and in a way, uh, you know, that uh, that underpins 
to some extent, the slow pace of negotiations. The science really, really only got to that, uh, that level of certainty uh, in 2007. I just wanted to make that point because I think we often overlook it. But now the science is exceedingly strong and um, this is one of the reasons, by the way, all the slides that I'm showing here are extracted out of the latest IPCC report. I think except one right at the end, which comes from an earlier IPCC report. So I'm not putting IPCC on every slide. You can literally go to the summary for policy makers reports and find every single one of these images. So uh, this is one of the brilliant pieces of science that has come out of uh, the, the 1990s, the development of climate models, their, um, their increasing complexity. And uh, what, we, what we see in this slide is uh, the, the observed change in temperature, and it's plotted against uh, two alternative hypotheses. One is if the climate that we observe was being driven only by natural processes, such as solar activity and volcanic activity. We know that volcanoes tend to cool the climate. Uh, solar activity has a very minor effect on, on climate uh, in the current era. And then the other hypothesis that you see there in brown is the what the models would say the temperature of the world would do if we were to add in global greenhouse gases, uh, human emissions. And the observed is the black line. And you can see there, if ever an hypothesis was was uh, was was well tested, this one has been well tested. The models agree extremely well that uh, the observed warming, at least since the 1950s, is by far uh, mostly caused by human impact. So that uh, we can put that one to bed. And uh, the denialists need to, um, well, they've, they've become much more quiet about this kind of thing. OK. What does that mean in, over a longer term and over the course of, of human history? So here we see that spike, that warming spike in uh, that, you know, the zero would be the long term average. And you can see it's now well above one degrees warmer than that long term average. And we, we take this back really to the start. Well, not quite to the start of, of human civilization, it's in se several thousand years. And um, we can see that the spike really, really stands out. And on the left hand side of this, this graph, you can see that um, that little bar there, which represents, um, if I could my, my masterwork, there we go. This bar here represents the warmest multi century period in 100,000 years. So going back about half, half the, maybe a little bit under half the age of our, our species. We can see that we're pushing temperatures to a level that um, that is not starting to really exceed the environmental history of our, of our of us as a species, and certainly of us as a modern species. This is where modern society evolved under relatively stable climatic conditions, and we've pushed it way out of this out of this envelope. We understand that very well. What are the impacts? This is also from the Working Group One report. Uh, and I'm just going to go through these really quickly. This is a stylized map of the planet with the different uh, regions and showing uh, the assessment, the latest assessment of um, changes in hot extremes and their attribution to human uh, to human causes. And we can see that for most of the planet, hot extremes have been incre increasing. We can attribute those to, to a human impact. Uh, slam dunk argument right there. And these are the levels of certainty, the three dots, the two dots. And you can see where we're less certain and where we're more certain and where there have been fewer changes and where there have been more changes. Um, impacts on heavy precipitation and flooding, something that's of, of, of uh, uppermost in our minds at the moment. And you can see here in green areas of the world where we have uh, quite a bit of confidence in, 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 in increases in flooding events. And uh, we know around the world this has been uh, increasing. I'm just showing some impacts that really affect human society. Uh, I'm not talking about ecosystems or anything. This is direct impacts on humans. And here are uh, the attribution of um, adverse impacts generally on agriculture uh, through, ecology, uh, through, through drought conditions. And we can see uh, in brown here where things have been getting much drier and uh, northern Australia a little bit wetter. So, you know, the world is changing and um, atmosphere has changed, the climate has changed, 
the potential for adverse impacts on human society is ramping up and, and uh, the latest science supports that very strongly. The latest science also has been able to link our emissions, our uh, emissions of CO2 or, or methane expressed in CO2 terms um, with the observed warming. And we can see now from, from the science that there is a, a virtually linear relationship between emissions and, um, and temperature rise. Uh, this, this curve, of course, will curve over and saturate. You can't add infinite CO2 into the atmosphere and continue to get warming. It, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a saturating curve. But we can see that certainly over the next few thousand gigatons of CO2 emissions, we will continue to see, if we put those emissions into the atmosphere, we'll continue to see rises in, in temperature. So there's the your historical trend, and these are the projections for different scenarios of the future, which uh, represent different socioeconomic pathways. SSP stands for Shared Socioeconomic Pathway, and different warming levels. So the, these numbers, 1.9, 2.6, <clears throat> 4.5, et cetera, refer to how much uh, warming is, is um, induced by the, the CO, by, by, by that scenario. And it's measured for those of you who want to know in watts per meter squared around the planet. In other words, so 8.5 watts per meter squared would be the equivalent of having an 8.5 watt light or energy emitting diode positioned on every square meter around the planet's surface. That's what 8.5 watts per meter squared means. The 1.9 is obviously a much lower lower number but the science here is strong and this is this is a really really good tool now for in, for assessing uh what uh, what we have to do and the what is very clear now is that our efforts to mitigate our efforts to reduce emissions trade off against the need for adaptation so the more we invest here to bring emissions down or re avoid emissions, the less we have to adapt. The more we emit, the more we're going to have to adapt. And this really is the crux of the negotiations, is how can we get uh, find this optimum balance between investment in mitigation and the avoided need to invest in, 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 in adaptation, which we don't understand very well how to do. We don't understand how much it costs. A lot of uncertainties here. This we understand very well, and we even understand that there are many, many economic benefits to mitigating. So in a way, you ask, why are we even running this experiment? Why don't we just uh, follow a mitigation pathway? We'll see why uh, later. Um, and then if we just, uh, so, so I'm really pulling out the absolute essence of the, of the latest reports here. If we project into the future uh, different um, emissions scenarios and shared socioeconomic pathways, we can see that there's some real choices to be made. The decisions that we make now over the course of the next decade or, uh, and, a, and, and more will really affect where we end up um, towards the end of the century. And those uh, decisions have some very real effects on our planet. And this is, this is what's been done, that's come out of the Working Group 2 report, where uh, what Working Group 2 puts together and has been doing for the last few cycles is, uh, is this, this, this graph of, of reasons for concern, which show um, where we start to get more and more concerned in uh, you know, where, where the risk goes from, from moderate to high to very high, represented by these different colors and uh, associated with, with levels of, of uncertainty. Uh, for a couple of different major areas of concern, unique and threatened systems. These would be ecosystems, um, um, cryosphere systems, and, and other sorts of unique systems around the planet. Extreme weather events, the global distribution of impacts, uh, so how the, it's spread across the planet, the intensity of, of impacts around the planet. Um, the global aggregate, so you know when you put it all together in, 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 into a single metric, quite hard to do. And then what are called large scale singular events, which some people might call tipping points. And we can see that for, um, you know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a gradation here. Unique and threatened systems are, are very, uh, are affected, at, uh, are at high risk very soon. Extreme weather events a little bit later, but still well under two degrees. 
And then these bigger global aggregated impacts, the risks um, uh, are, are a little bit further away. And you can see in relation to the to the emission scenarios and the warming scenarios, the the outcome of um, of of these decisions. So these are you know, basically in these terms, crazy decisions to to go to these sorts of levels. And that's one of the big contributions of work group two is to is to is to link these two things quite directly. So that brings brings me back to our um, our tool here, which which shows that the relationship between cumulative emissions. So every time you you you, you jump in your car, and you drive down to the cafe unnecessarily, <laughs> you emit a few kilograms of CO2. Every single one of those kilograms is accumulating on this axis. Uh, just to uh, just to remind you. <laughs> Um, and that is associated with a potential rise in temperature on the y-axis. And what I've put in yellow here is the is the negotiating space that we are now in um, over the next uh, you know decade and possibly more. Hopefully, hopefully not more. Hopefully, we'll have solved it uh, within within a decade, but or at least made a lot of increase in effort. And it shows you very nicely. You know, this is this is mitigation effort. This is adaptation effort, and we we know that these these rises in temperature are associated with some very very real risks, um, which will occur over the next few few decades. Right. So, and what uh, what working group three, which works on mitigation, has done, is to really start looking at uh, what is projected. Uh, we know that we've had negotiations now for uh, for 20 years or so in the Framework Convention. Countries have made commitments, these nationally determined contributions. Uh, that that has been decided. We, we will devolve this to individual countries to make their commitments. Some countries will ask for support in supporting their commitments. And these, if if these commitments prior that were announced prior to the previous conference of the parties in Glasgow, COP26. Um, the, these have been modeled in uh, with this red line, and we can see that uh, with those commitments already on the table, we will not avoid a, a one and a half degree future. We will likely not avoid a two degree future. It will be very, very difficult to avoid a two degree warming. And uh, we know uh, that, that, that that starts to introduce a whole lot of, a lot of risks. Um, and in order to avoid that, we've got to adopt some very stringent emissions pathways going into the future as a planet. Massive, massive challenge. Um, and this this just uh, just another uh, another version of the same idea. The the national determined contributions range, uh, sort of a business as usual um, with some commitments, and then what we really need to avoid um, you know, uh, real risks uh, of the next decade or so. I'm waiting for time. Yeah. Good. Now, one of the things that that I think is is wildly underappreciated is, is that we we emit uh, you know roughly 10 gigatons of carbon uh, into the atmosphere every year as a as a, as a as a economic species. Something like 40, some somewhere north of 40 gigatons of CO2. But it, it, people may not realize that those 40 gigatons of CO2 or 10 tons of carbon, and, and, you know, this, the CO2 molecule has a certain amount of carbon and a certain amount of oxygen in it, right? So sometimes you'll see this expressed as carbon and sometimes you'll see it expressed as CO2. So the CO2 numbers are always um, uh, 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 roughly 10 times higher than the uh, than the um, carbon numbers. So um, while we emit 10 tons of carbon into the atmosphere, only about five tons of carbon emerge in the atmosphere. And uh, that's expressed as a certain change in the concentration about uh, two, somewhere between two and three parts per million. Um, what happens to the other half of our emissions? They don't, we emit carbon, but it doesn't emerge in the atmosphere. Where is it going? This is, this is widely underappreciated. About 30% uh, uh, of our emissions are sequestered, are stored 
into what are called land-based sinks. Natural ecosystems store carbon. Their, their, their ability to store carbon has been somewhat stimulated by rising atmospheric CO2 and warming. And another 30% or so is, is, stored, is stored in the oceans uh, in the form of, of um, ocean acidification, right? So, so while we emit from, from fossil fuels and land use change somewhere north of 10 gigatons of, of, of carbon a year, about 60% uh, of that is sequestered by natural ecosystems. And that, that's well worth remembering because if we were to try to generate economically that amount of carbon sequestration, uh, it would cost us billions. You know, we, we're getting this, these ecosystem services are essentially happening for free. So that's one thing. They depend on healthy ecosystems on land. Uh, you know, a, a system without plants and without nutrients is not going to be able to sequester the carbon that uh, that goes into this land-based carbon sink. So one of our uh, big issues and one of my focuses here at the climate school is where are these sinks? How do we protect them? How do we make sure that this is, which is one of the biggest bangs for buck that we have working for us, is not threatened? And uh, so we've got some work underway trying to figure out in Southern Africa where, where these, these big sinks are. And it's, it's kind of interesting, but uh, I'm not going not to give away any secrets yet. And then the ocean sink, of course, the Southern Ocean around, uh, around our coast is a big sink for, for Carmen as well. It's one of the biggest sinks. Um, we need to protect those. There's another uh, um, problem associated with, with these sinks, and that is that if we endeavor to draw carbon out of the atmosphere, so one of the approaches that we need to do is to, is to start to extract CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so if you withdraw a ton of carbon using some chemical method, in effect, you're only withdrawing a half a ton because these sinks will off gas. They will re release the CO2 that they've been storing as we've increased CO2. And uh, this is something that's not appreciated. Uh, so not if you want to sequester carbon actively, you've got to sequester twice as much in relation to what you're really aiming to sequester. So uh, that's something I just wanted to remind, uh, to remind people of because we often forget it. Okay, so that, uh, I don't know if anybody's got a quick question around the science, um, uh, because I want to now, um, having having gone through and reminded everybody of, of the latest science, yeah, uh, I want to go into into a solution, uh, a solution space, and to to try out um, try out this, this this software that I'm talking about. So, uh, um, Tarina Wala, I'm just going to find. I'm just going to get onto the website in the shared screen and. Um, Sure, guy. Let's. Uh, if there are any questions, you can uh, give me a shot. <laughs> I, I haven't seen anything in the chat box. I right. just invited people again to type their questions there or raise a hand. So I'm okay. happy to take any quick questions if there are any. So uh, I think I might. Uh, I'm going to unshare my screen and then I'm going to reshare. Um, here we go. Are you? Uh, are you seeing? Wait, wait, wait. You should be. No, wait, what has happened here? Let me just get out of this. Guys, so we. I could see your previous. We can see your screens now. So. Okay. I'm not sure if you wanted to go to a specific share screen. Um, there, there is a quick question from the audience. If you wanted to respond to that while you are searching for yes. that screen. Yes. No. Um, no. Mr. Lowe asks, um, please explain the trade-off between mitigation and adaptation again. Yes. Um, so essentially, uh, the, the more we can mitigate, in other words, the more we can invest in reducing warming, the less we have to invest in adaptation. In other words, adapting to warming. That's basically what I'm, uh, what I'm getting at. Is that... Uh, does that make sense? And it's about finding that balance, I guess. I exactly. So oh, I don't know why this keeps on doing this to me. Uh, whenever I share my screen, Tarina, it goes back to 
to this. Um, I need to get. Yeah, yeah, it's fine. And the negotiations are, are all. So, so some countries will say, well, you know, we'll help you adapt. Uh, we, you know, if we if we transfer funds to to adaptation, will that give us more space to 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 keep on emitting? And that that I think is, uh, you know, that's super super problematic. Um, and what you also mentioned, guys, that we we don't really know how to adapt always. There's a lot of uncertainty that's, about adaptation. That's, right? That is that is a really significant problem. Is we, you know we we uh, there's a huge yeah. amount of uncertainty around how best to um, to adapt. What do you what are you seeing on your screen now, Tarina? Um, I see a kind of a a image, I guess. Uh, no, it's, um, it's, I'm just trying to get my. There we see why, Google. I don't know why my uh, Chrome doesn't want to get. Ah, wait. What what do you see now? Um, we see your Google screen. Ah, your. I don't know why that. Google Chrome or something. All right. So so thanks for the question. Um, and I hope I've I've done it some justice. Um, we can return to that. But let me let me show you. Uh, I want to I want to ask the audience to. Um, to suggest their solutions, their, their, their favorite solutions for um, for this this problem. And uh, what I'm what I'm going to take you to is this 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 what's called the the, the Enroad simulator. It's, it's developed by a group called Climate Act Interactive out of, of MIT. They they they're one of our um, one of our partners in the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate, and they've developed this. This beautiful piece of software over over several years, uh, maybe more than a decade actually. And what I love about it is that it's it's just this one page. And what we're seeing, and I wanted to try it out as a pilot with everybody, is um, a bunch of things. So on the left hand side here is the a graph in showing in exajoules per year our sources of of primary energy from uh, over the next you know over the course of the century. And then in this right hand graph, we have a trace of the pro projected emissions of CO2 equivalent. So it would be CO2 and methane and other, other emissions expressed in CO2 terms. And that is that is given in a blue and a black line. And you'll see that the, the, uh, the blue line is our current scenario. And then we can we can we, we're going to play around with the black line. We're going to try and get that black line to to come down. And then on the right hand side here is you see the net effect on global temperature by 2100. OK, so we want to find a solution that will get us to below two, preferably to one and a half. By adjusting these policy or uh, uh, solution levers. So what have we got in, the, in terms of solutions? We've got a, a set of solutions around energy supply, coal, you know, and and these we can use these sliders to to push these up and down. And you can <clears throat> do this on your own machine. This is free software. You can get in and play around with this. I find it incredibly useful as a teaching tool, but as a negotiating tool, I think it's also important. Remember, it's a global level. It's not regional. It's a purely global thing. So energy supply, we can we can talk about uh, nuclear, uh, new zero carbon technologies, natural gas, bioenergy, and setting a carbon price. Right. So a policy. You know. Then in this middle column, we've got transport efficiencies, we've got efficiencies in buildings and industry, and then we can fiddle around with growth, the population growth and economic growth. Uh, you know, for those of you who think that the only way to save the world is to is to crash economic growth and and, and destroy the system, we can see what what happens. Um, and then the, uh, in this column, we're talking about land and industrial emissions. So this is from uh, methane and other gases, mainly in the agricultural space. Deforestation. Uh, can we can we slow deforestation in the mainly in the tropics? Afforestation. What happens if we plant bunches, millions and millions of trees around the planet? We can play around with that one. And then new technology. So advanced new tech. All right. So Tarina, um, does does anybody have a strong uh, uh, suggestion about what? what would be uh, the, an efficient solution? Where, where should we be putting our energy 
and our investment in uh, in trying to bring this curve down. Uh, does somebody want to want to shout out? Um, is there somebody who has a favorite solution that they? There's one, there's a suggestion for coal reduction from Mr. Lowe, and I, I would have chosen that one as well. All right, so let's just say, let's just, you know, let's just reduce coal as, as much as we possibly can. There's also um, from Prof. Luis de Tue ending deforestation. Super. All right, so I'll do that one next. So, so if we just focused on purely looking at coal reduction, you can see what happens. You, you pull coal down, and if you look at what I do as I pull the coal down, uh, so coal is in, in, in brown on the left, and, and you see what happens is that um, you get somewhat of a compensation in other fossil fuels, and you have a little bit of an effect by 2100, but it's not that, it's not that great. So just working on coal per se, is not your silver bullet globally. Let's look at, uh, did you say deforestation? Yeah, ending deforestation. Right, so let's, let's, get the, let's get the Brazilians and others to stop deforesting. Um, so that's the effect. It's, it's a point one of a degree if we just focused on deforestation. It's, it's, it's quite surprising, isn't it? I mean, I, I was... Literally, I felt that this would also be very, very effective. But on its own, it's not particularly effective. I, I, extraordinary, isn't it? Anybody else want to want to want to say want to shout something? The next one is afforestation. Okay, let's plant millions of trees around the world and destroy our beautiful grassland ecosystems by planting trees in the wrong places. Let's destroy livelihoods and steal water away from everybody. Cool. Bang. <laughs> Sorry, I'm being very facetious. But afforestation also not massively effective, is it? 0.1 of a degree. Uh, and you, by the way, you can get a bit more into the detail of each of these things to see what we're talking about with uh, with with these with these methods. So this is there's more detail hidden here with these three dots. I'm not, I'm not going into it because of time limitations. So that's that's also uh, surprisingly uh, not as effective as some people might think. What about um, who, who's a big nuclear fan? I don't see any here. <laughs> the the next one is increasing renewables. That okay. was one guy. Look, uh, the point is that there's no you know, there are very few silver bullets here. <laughs> It's just, you've got to do these things in conjunction with each other. What about um, what about if you if you tackled it from a demand side instead of looking at supply? You went okay. What if we were to electrify transport? Uh, you know what what would that what would that do? And and increase the energy efficiency of transport. All right. So now we're working on the supply side. And you can see we, we, we're starting to get somewhere. If we were to electrify, modernize, electrify our cities and, and increase the energy efficiency of our cities and our... Can, can you see, when you start working on the supply side and you, it, you really incentivize energy efficiency and electrification, you can really start to make some inroads here. So a big part of our solution is in our system. And, and electrifying it, okay? Isn't that, isn't that fascinating? I just find this just such an interesting exercise to, to play around with. So engineers, you guys are sitting on the solutions. There are lots of solutions here. What about uh, economic growth? If we crashed economic growth, you know, if we just destroyed the economy of the planet, um, you know, it's, it's gonna help, but it's, it's miserable. It doesn't really, really give us, uh, and if we, if we stop, you know, population growth. Also, it's not going to buy us much. What about uh, uh, you know agriculture? If we were to to really increase the efficiency of agriculture, uh, we we get something here. And but what if we were to put a price on carbon? What if we were to use the market? Could we, through adjusting, putting a big price on carbon, could we have a big impact?
So that I find actually quite fascinating. So if we use economics, where's Stan? <laughs> if we use economics, if we use economic incentives and put a carbon price into our system, we've internalized the price of carbon. That really starts to give us some big, some big inroads. And uh, say we combine that with some supply side stuff in transport and uh, and and buildings. Now you know. Now we are really starting to get towards two degrees. We're not there yet, guys. I mean, this is these are massive changes already, and we're not even at two degrees, right? You're starting to see how difficult this is. Uh, we've got to do other things. We've got to get, uh, you know, we've got to get our land use better under control, right? So that starts to bring us down to below two degrees. We can we can help this along with deforestation. That gives us another little increment. And, um, you know, we, we could play around with, you know, economic growth doesn't really make a difference here. So if you push economic growth up under this scenario, all you're doing is you boosting investment in renewables. And this gives you this really interesting interaction between, so you, you don't have to destroy the world's economy in order to get a solution. If you've got the right incentives in place, if you've got the right societal structures in place, you can grow economically, you can pump e economic growth and still say, stay under 1.8 degrees. Isn't that fascinating? Uh, I find that really, really interesting from a business perspective. Uh, and then, you know, if we can really roll out some high tech uh, technologies, uh, some new tech solutions, uh, with you know some new engineering solutions, so you can go and look at what the, what tech is, is is being talked about here. Now you're really talking about um, a new world where we've got a lot of renewables, we've got a lot of economic growth, we've got some high tech solutions. Our cities are clean, electrified. Our transport systems are clean and electrified, and all we needed was a good economic policy around carbon price. Isn't that amazing? <laughs> um, uh, there are many, 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 so many comments now in the chat box. <laughs> <laughs> I've, I've, I couldn't keep up anymore, but um, I guess an interesting one. Well, okay, there's obviously the 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 viewpoint that it needs to be a combination of these things. I guess an interesting point is how these things would influence each other. So if you put a very high carbon price, how would that perhaps um, yeah, affect some of the other that, negative this, issues. Th this work is done with a fully interactive economic model. So putting a high carbon price is factored into the economic growth equation. So uh, that uh, you, that's the beauty of this particular piece of software is you're not doing things in isolation. You do when you when you make one intervention, it 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 ripples through all the other interventions using a you know using a, a, a an economic uh, a model i think it's rather fascinating you know nuclear it's not going to help us it, it's just if we can come up with new zero carbon uh, ways of producing energy they would be be very stimulated by a high carbon price so if we put up new zero carbon and and we and we reduce the price uh, we reduce the carbon price we can see how that changes uh, changes investments. So, you know, uh, how, how are you going to stimulate uh, new zero carbon uh, technologies? This requires what's what's called a huge breakthrough, a Cinderella uh, technology that hasn't been invented yet kind of thing. Um, but you can go and look at, at what, you know, what what this means by, uh, by going a bit more into the background here. Uh, you know, I'm just giving you really a superficial look at this. I'm trying to stimulate some discussion, some, some thinking around uh, around these solutions. And um, number one, how difficult it is. But number two, uh, how potentially amazing it could be. So uh, I don't know if I'm being naive, but uh, you know, I think this 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 opens up some really really interesting discussion points. And and it really puts to bed, uh, you know, why is the world, why is the, the northern hemisphere so focused on afforestation? It's so ineffective. Um, is it just is it just 
it, it, it's just a displacement activity and it has huge potential adverse implications for ecosystems. So I, I'm, I'm more and more uh, averse to the afforestation solution. Deforestation helps us a little bit. It has all sorts of other benefits, of course, but it's not it's not really where the where the big action is. The big action is here, is in the demand side, uh, and and you know in the tech in the tech side. So you know, guy, there are some interesting yeah. questions coming yes, up here. Um, yeah, Arnold yeah. Arnold Smith asked, can this model be applied on a country level as well? I I love that question. I I would uh, absolutely love to 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 have something like this. Of course. You wouldn't get the global um, uh, tem temperature effect, but I think an economic approach like this, which 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 shows you the integrated effect on on energy supply, would be extremely valuable. And in fact, South Africa does um, have a, a modelling team that um, works with the negotiating team in the UNFCCC <clears throat> that that does this kind of work. Of course, they're not doing it in exactly this way. But um, you can be sure that uh, there, there are economic models and, and South African Treasury is quite well versed in this kind of modeling. And um, so, so they do look at, uh, at impacts in this way. But I, I, I love that idea. And, um, you know, we, as, as members of the Global Alliance of Universities on Climate, I'm sure we can, we can uh, and I am in touch with the MIT team, I've met some of them, uh, we can look at them, uh, look at the code, ask them to, to share some code with us and maybe uh, w w with, a, with a view to developing a more a regional or, or, or national level model like this uh, with certain objectives would be, I think, extremely interesting. So please approach me if you want to do that and we can, we can talk to the MIT folks and the development team to see, um, to see uh, how to do it. I think it'll be a lot of fun in engineering and and other areas of the university teaching a regime to or teaching curriculum to start looking at this kind of thing um, get the computer science people organized the data school uh, there's all sorts of opportunities there Tarina, other other questions I'm sorry. yeah um look i i like that um you mentioned all of these disciplines because i think it fits in so well with our school for climate studies and it's multi multidisciplinary and multi-faculty nature um so hopefully everybody looking at at this will try will kind of see themselves in those different areas that needs addressing um, to to mitigate. So that would be uh, fantastic, you know. Yeah, and, and you, um, you, yeah great. Other okay, questions? more hey. questions. Um, so mm. there was a question about what is a high carbon price in this model from Martin De Wint. Ah, let's go and have a look at it. Uh, I think it's about two hundred and fifty dollars a ton, if I remember right. Yes. So we, what, what we're talking about here with is, is, is a ramp up from 2025 or 2022 to 2030 uh, from zero to $250 a, a ton. And you can play around with this, right? So you can ramp it, ramp it up to, to $100 a ton. You can, you can phase it in earlier or later. So, so now you, you're getting into a little bit more detail on, on this modeling. Which, uh, which I'm sure a lot of people would be would be very interested in. So you, you know, now you're kicking in a carbon price in in 2050, and you know, can you? So, so there's some nuance stuff that you can. It, this this changes the the length of the ramp, and uh, uh, yeah. So so that you can you can play around here. Economists who want to want to get a little bit more more detailed, you can get in here and start uh, start playing around with, with 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 other things as well. Good. More questions. OK, so there was a question from Christian Loom. I wonder if the economic model will consider the issue of climate justice. <laughs> no, this is purely um, this is this is purely fact based. So there's no um, there's no ethics in this. And that I think it would be enormously valuable. So what would a, a climate justice scenario, what would be within the range of a, of a just transition uh, to, a, to, to, to be achievable here? And I think what a brilliant question to approach MIT with. Guys, we're interested to develop a, a, an equitable pathway 
towards a solution. And our criteria are X, Y, Z. How would we do it? And I, you know, I think you could, for example, you could run a workshop with, uh, with the MIT uh, experts where you use this tool and uh, interrogate some of the assumptions uh, against a, a justice um, set of criteria. I think that would be absolutely fascinating. You could publish something like that. I think that would be, and in fact, I think it would be something that you could even do in the lead up to COP27 and say, uh, from a climate justice perspective, using the software, this is the kind of set of solutions that, that will work. I think it'd be an absolutely brilliant thing to do. So I would be more than happy to facilitate and help that happen. But uh, I think it'd be super, super exciting. Uh, as a climate school, we are working on a youth leadership training uh, program uh, for a small group of students in the lead up to COP27 as one of our activities. So that, that would make a very, very interesting contribution to that. Great suggestion, great question, thank you. Guy, another one uh, that's kind of a combination of a few questions. What would a high carbon price mean for South Africa in practice and how would, we, how would it be practically implemented? Well, we have a carbon tax already, uh, and uh, you know our big carbon emitters are are, are wriggling around, uh, trying to trying to avoid as much as possible. Uh, I, look, at some point, we may well get external pressure to to reduce emissions. It's like a de facto tax, in which case, you know, all our investments in 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 high priced coal energy generation are going to be stranded assets. So um, a high carbon price would mean would mean South Africa would 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 have to move very very rapidly uh, to alternative uh, energy supply through renewables. Um, I don't see I don't see any other way around it. I, you know we could maybe do some carbon capture and storage, but that's extremely expensive, and we don't really know how effective it would be in our context. So it, carbon capture and storage would be. To, to capture emissions coming off of Madupi and Kusile and uh, extract the CO2 and bury it below ground. Um, but yeah, it would also mean uh, very, very strong incentives from business to, to electrify and to increase their energy efficiency. Um, you know, people would want to work from home more and avoid, avoid um, driving, driving to work. Companies would be trying to disincentivize their staff from, from uh, increasing their carbon footprints, all sorts of implications. These things ramify across uh, across society in, in, in very serious ways. So yeah, the just energy transition is uh, is, is, is again relevant here. God, that's an, and I really apologize to everybody I'm missing along the way, but um, oh. I'm trying to just catch a question here and there, and I'm sure that we you could, would be very happy to have more discussions with people. We could we could after this. To really, if we could. Uh, if we could copy out all the questions and and get a list, I could maybe spend a bit of time and just just jot down some quick answers for everybody. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of them you have actually replied to, but uh, we can okay. very easily get them from from this uh, team's site. So that would be uh, that would be very interesting because that would also it gives me a lot of insight into what where people's uh, real interest and questions are lying, and that would help guide some of you know some of our work and some of the kind of collaborations we're trying to build so yeah please if we could do that it would be yeah i think this the the specific interest also in this uh, in um for example in the just uh yes in the justice in the whole thing and and a comment also from dr van eeren saying it would be interesting to model historic emission volumes from developed countries have brought us to where we are and then bring in the question of just transitions <laughs> um, challenge is how to allocate historic emissions to countries, products, consumers, etc. That's that's that actually has been quite well done. Um, back to about yeah, probably at least 1950 and probably earlier. Um, so we, we we know pretty well where the emissions come from, and most the vast emissions prior to 1950 were coal. And then oil really starts to take off from 1950 onwards. Mm. Um, so, so that's quite well known. The attribution to particular industries, probably less well known, uh, but 
I think, uh, reasonably um, well established. Guy, there was also a question about the electrification of transport um, and whether the public or the private is, is that, would that be required for public transport, private transport? How would that, I guess, both? I don't know. Um, yeah, I mean, in most countries, the, the, the vast, uh, uh, you know, a lot of emissions come from, from private transport. Um, and electrific electrification of tra private transport can really make a difference. You know, it, it clearly uh, the source of the energy to charge the, the batteries in those electric cars is, is the critical question. But mm -hmm. once you've got an electric fleet, the transition to renewables gains you massive benefits immediately. So, you know, there, there are two things you've got to get right. You've got to get the, the supply right and the demand right. If you can get your demand right by demanding electricity versus fossil fuels, you, you're creating a massive market for renewables. And, uh, you know, people who've got solar panels on their roof could be charging their own cars. And, um, you know, that, that, that is an unstoppable force now. The, the, the economics are so strong that uh, th that disruption will happen. It's already happening in, in Europe. I mean, Tesla is, is, is ripping VW to pieces in, in Europe, for example. Um, so, and, you know, in some of the, Nor uh, I think in, in Norway or, or Sweden, electric cars are the, the vast majority of cars sold. So, so that, th that's unstoppable. And then you get all sorts of really interesting things like distributed charging systems. People could, uh, could put charging stations outside their houses and, and share them on social media. <laughs> People could come and charge your car, uh, you know, in Stellenbosch, uh, et cetera, et cetera. All sorts of, you get all sorts of things that get unlocked in, in a world like that with, with cheap mm -hmm. energy. Mm -hmm. It's a completely different world. But uh, that, that's a whole different discussion. That, that you get different constraints coming in there. So then, uh, then, then you, you threaten the environment in other ways. Mm -hmm. I think there is the, uh, a very interesting question, and maybe as a last comment, uh, what Stellenbosch University is doing to dis disincentivize uh, emission, carbon emission, and uh, or to incentivize reduction of emissions. And I know that there are a number of things um, underway um, through facilities management, through the rectorate as well. Um, so I don't think we can go into that now, but it certainly is a question also for us as an institution, of course. And uh, as the host of the School for Climate Studies, something that we will continue to focus on. Um, Guy, I, th I think it's two o'clock and I, I can sense that people need to run to attend other Sorry. meetings. Um, That's it, fun. Thank from you. From my side, thank you for an incredible, um, thought-provoking uh, presentation and, and really interactive. And it was very, very nice to see the questions popping up. Uh, we will try to get them to you. So Lovely. that you can Thank look you. at the ones that you haven't replied to and perhaps give some feedback. Thank I've you really so much. Enjoyed it. Thanks for the forum, uh, Tarina, and thanks for people for coming. Look forward to interacting with you into the future. We've got some announcements uh, relating to climate school coming up and all sorts of stuff starting to happen. So uh, look forward to that. OK, thanks. and many, many thanks also popping up in the chat box. About oh, thanking you for an excellent presentation. Keep well, everybody.